How do you be a better father? And if you're not yet a father, how do you be a great father when you ultimately become one? I personally would love to, uh, to be a father. I have plans to be a father. I'd love to have two or three children. Hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. So I'm very much looking forward to today's uh, interview. Today, we're going to be talking about three ways to be a better father and three ways to be a great father if you're not one. Um, so to help us figure that out, we're talking to a fellow by the name of Larry Hagner from The Good Dad Project, which is a resource for helping men be the best versions of themselves, whether they're a husband or whether they're a father. Larry is the author of the best-selling book on Amazon called Dad's Edge. Larry, great to have you here. How are you doing? James Swanick, how are you? Doing so well, doing so Good. well. Thank you very much. And I know you have a podcast as well on this, and uh, which you co-host with Sean Stevenson, uh, who I've had on the podcast uh, before, who talks a lot about sleep and is a sleep expert. Uh, he's a good guy, Sean, isn't he? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, if you're a father, sometimes we all need more sleep. So yeah, we, we all need that resource as a father, no doubt about it. Yeah. So you, I'm assuming then Larry, that you must be a father. I am a father. I'm actually expecting my fourth child. So, and, and then once you get to the fourth child, uh, you just don't get congratulated anymore. It's kind of like, wow. That's crazy. What's wrong? What's wrong with you? So yeah, we're expecting our fourth boy actually in wow. February. Yeah, wow. four boys in a row, huh? So is, is your does your wife um, has she been like, oh, I really want a daughter. I really want a girl. And so now she's like just beside herself. She's really pissed off and angry that it just keeps you keep getting <laughs> out boys. <laughs> Uh, the answer to that is yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, she's surrounded by testosterone. I mean, yeah. she's, there's a special place in heaven, I think, for her. She's been dying to have a girl, but I don't know. I just don't think I make girls. I think that's just what it boils <laughs> down to. You have very powerful sperm, which produces, <laughs> obviously. My mother's the same. She had three boys. I'm the oldest of three boys. Um, okay. And so it's funny, you know, when I, when, I, when I see my mom, I always try to do like a shopping day. I mean, I hate shopping. I hate shopping. She's a woman. She loves it. So I always make sure that at least once a year when I see her, we go shopping. And that's kind of like me acting like the daughter she never had, you know? <laughs> there you go. I, I'm right there with you, though. I don't know many guys who absolutely love to shop, and I'm definitely not one of them either. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your story, Larry. You got your fourth <clears throat> kid on the way. But, um, you know, what, what inspired you to, to be a better father? How did this all come about? Tell us your, your personal story before we dig into these three ways to be a better father. Yeah, sure. So the, the way I grew up, I grew up in a pretty chaotic environment when it came to um, fathers and father figures in my life. Um, my biological father and my mother were divorced when I was about nine months old. And after that, I really didn't see him uh, at all. Um, in fact, I remember being about four years old and my mom was still single. And I remember, you know, being in preschool and a lot of kids with their dads would come to pick them up. And in my mind, I was like, well, you know, I guess the moms just kind of go out and find a dad, you know? So uh, my mom got remarried when I was five and uh, it was, it was actually a, a cool experience for a little while. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, relationship took a turn for, for, you know, it became pretty toxic. He was a big drinker and um, he was abusive, you know, kind of physically, mentally. And then when I was 10, he, they got divorced. And then unfortunately I never saw him again. So an interesting thing happened when I was 12, and that was I actually ran into my biological father for the first time, uh, which was shocking, right? I mean, it's shocking for him. It was shocking for me. And we had this brief relationship for a couple months, and that just kind of fizzled out. The time from when I was 12 to about 18, my mom went through several relationships, kind of the same guy over and over again, uh, you know, just kind of drinker and, and kind of toxic. And so I think by the time I was like 16 years old, I was just kind of done with the whole father figure thing. I was like, you know, I'm not having a good experience with this. I probably, I'm not going to have one. This, that's just going to be that. When I was 30, two things happened. So 10 years ago, number one, I became a father for the very first time. And number two, I ran into my biological father again. Wow. It, yeah. It had been 20 years and it was a total fluke. We were, we were in a coffee shop here in St. Louis. He came walking through the door I knew who he was because I remembered him when I was 12. Uh, he hadn't changed very much. But what happened was is we ended up connecting. And we now, I, I'm happy to say this has a happy ending. Here we are 10 years later. Uh, we've got a good relationship. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a dad-son relationship. It's more of a friendship, but it's a good relationship. So basically the Good Dad Project came from me 
really wanting a guide because when I came, when I first became a father, I had no idea what to do because I didn't have that model kind of growing up, but I desperately wanted to know what to do, but I knew what I didn't want to do because I kind of had an experience of that all through my childhood growing up. So literally for about, about five years ago, I, I think I literally became like kind of like this mole where I sought out any type of personal development I could on how to be a better father, a better man, a better individual. Kind of funny thing is, is how I met you, which was at the Tony Robbins event last year. So I kind of, yeah, I mean, I kind of geek out over that stuff anyway. I love self-improvement. And what I have found on this journey is that becoming a better man, a byproduct of that is absolutely becoming a better father. And there are definitely pain points and there are struggles that all of us dads go through. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, Being a father can be very rewarding, but it can also be very humbling at the same time. I know you, for instance, you have a background in broadcasting. You're on ESPN and all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and and since you don't have kids yet, I'll give you a kind of a crash course on what it feels like to be a father. Yeah. So I, I want you to imagine for a second, you know, you being on ESPN and never having one tiny bit of training whatsoever on how to be a good communicator, a good broadcaster, you know, training your voice. Literally ESPN calls you and they're like, hey, go start broadcasting, go do it. You'd be frustrated, humbled, you know, you kind of probably stumble your way through it. It'd be, it, would, it would be very humbling experience. That's exactly the way being a father is. I mean, there's very little resources and training out there for us. And when you are a father, it's kind of like, here you go. Now you're a dad, go do it, go yeah. figure it out. And it can yeah. be frustrating for us. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, when I auditioned for ESPN, I didn't have any tra- any training, so I know what it was. Oh my like. gosh, so yeah. Baptism by fire, it was pretty, pretty scary stuff. Um, so now you have a good relationship with your father. That's, ter- that, that's terrific. That's amazing. Thank you. That's such a great, a great ending uh, to the story. So you, you did all this research, um, and, but I, I would imagine that even having done all the research, it still doesn't prepare you for that day when you actually take your child home for the first time, right? It's like, oh, oh my God, now I've got a human being I've got to take care of. Right. No, it's definitely still learning on the job. I mean, it's, it's constant learning. But it's, what I've found is, is that there, there are definitely pain points and struggles for men that we simply just don't talk about. Um, and I, I think one of, the thing, one of the platforms really that, that the Good Dad Project really offers these guys is it is a platform. It's, it's a way to talk about these challenges and these struggles openly um, and, and just be better at it. So, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we've really, we've really given these guys is more of a roadmap and a strategy of how to be better in, in all aspects of your fatherhood journey. Okay. So let's get into this then. Um, let's talk about these pain points for men and then these three ways to be a better father. Should we deal with the pain points first and then go into the three ways or do we just, or the three ways part of the pain points? Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we can, I can just talk about each one of them. So, I mean, I, I've been doing this now, the Good Dad Project for three years. I've, I've had a, an opportunity to interact and coach uh, several different men. I've, I also do speaking events. Uh, I've done several speaking events. And what I found is, is a lot of men, a lot of fathers really have very similar struggles that we simply do not talk about out loud. And one of one struggle in particular, I mean, the book that I just wrote goes over nine, but one in particular, there's one thing that all fathers struggle with most and they want more of it. And I, I bet you can maybe guess what that is. Ah, uh, let's have a look here. What is it that they want? They want, they want a better relationship with their, with their spouse as they're raising the child. They want more connection. They want more sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely want all of those things. But one thing in particular that I always hear every time I have a, a coaching session, a workshop or whatever it is, men want more patience. Okay. They definitely want more patience. And what I mean by that is, but there's two types of patience that we as men, and it doesn't matter if you're a father or not, because we all go through them. One of the, one of the things that we go through is internal patience and external patience. And what I mean by that is, so you have external factors that can literally challenge your day all day long. And you know, you've got deadlines, you've got emails, you've got people needing something from you every minute of every day in your job. And it can be very demanding. It can be very defeating. And so that can challenge you from an outside perspective. The other form of patience that we as fathers go through and men too is the internal dialogue patience. And what I mean by that is it's the voice that says, 
Why can't you handle this? You should be stronger than this. What's wrong with you? Those types of you know, voices that literally just yammer away at our self-confidence. So the book that I wrote really dives into how to manage you know, those two aspects of your life when it comes to patience. Okay, so it's the inner voice saying, why can't you handle this? Why aren't you enough? Why aren't you more on top of this? Uh, and so, it's, so, so men and fathers in particular, I guess they're juggling their work, they're juggling the, keeping their, their wife or partner happy and they're raising a, a child at the same time. Um, there's a lot of stress involved. There's a lot of stress involved. And so more patience then is a pain point. Is there a cure for that? Is there, is there a way on how we fix that? There, there's absolutely a way you can fix it. And you're exactly right. As, as you hit it right on the head, as men and fathers, we juggle so much, so much. You know, we try to keep that connection with our spouse. We try to keep a connection with our kids. We try to have patience, which ultimately we just want to enjoy the journey of fatherhood. But sometimes we just don't know how to do it. One way to absolutely give yourself more patience is taking time for self-care. In other words, doing something for yourself, whether that's for your health, um, for your well-being, you know, listening to a positive podcast, reading something inspiring from a book, challenging, challenging yourself to grow more and more. Um, on a daily basis, though, it's really being proactive in your mindset. And what I mean by that is you have to plan and you always have to plan to be on your A game. Like, for instance, in your work life, when, you're on, when you were on ESPN, right? Before you did your broadcast, I mean, think about this for a second. Before you did your broadcast, what did you do like five minutes before you went on, on TV? Yeah, well, I mean, I was, uh, most of the time it was just getting mentally prepared for it. I was going over my notes, getting into the zone. It's like when I go and speak on the stage, it's like I change my state. So like, am I a powerful person? Right, I'm going, I'm getting this energy, ready, set, go. So I'm, I guess five minutes before I'm changing my state in preparation. Absolutely. So you, you're getting your mind, your body, everything you're doing is you're getting ready for that event. And I mean, it's, it's no different if you're, you know, if you have something like that, or if you're uh, in the workplace and you're getting ready for a big presentation in front of clients, or you're getting ready for a big presentation in front of your boss, or you're getting ready to go on a job interview. You are always prepping. You're getting ready to, to be in that situation, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. To be honest with you, being a father and coming home from a long day at work is no different than getting into that same mental state. I'll give you an example. Most men, and I was the exact same way, and the reason I can speak to this stuff is because I suffered through it just terribly. Uh, most men, what we do from nine to five isn't necessarily our passion. Sometimes we kind of struggle through it. We work hard, you know, and then we get home and we're just kind of like, we're just done. So what most men do is from the time they get out of their car and walk in the front door, there is no prep. There is no proactive thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? There's just walking through the door. And usually, and, and you'll find this out, James, too, is when you walk into the door with three kids, I know you said you wanted two or three, it's madness. It's chaos. I mean, my wife and I joke you know, uh, about it all the time that raising three boys is like raising three drunks. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're nine, they're seven, it's loud, it's crazy. And a lot of times, we as men, we just came from a chaotic environment at work. And now we're just stepping right back into another chaotic environment, which all we want is kind of a sanctuary. So here's what I tell men to, to work on their patience muscle. When you are on your way home from work, um, what you'll want to do is take at least a few minutes to get your mind right. Get your mind in that same state you were talking about before you get on stage, before you were on, uh, being broadcasted. You get in that same state. And how do you do that? Put on some powerful, empowering music, something that will get you in the mindset. Put on a podcast maybe that's inspiring or like an audio book that's inspiring. Um, something that is going to break the pattern of that defeated thought and where you basically feel like you have no patience. Another strategy that you can do is there are some days, I'll be honest with you, that just doesn't work because you're just defeated, you're exhausted, a lot going on. So sometimes... You absolutely have to bring the happiness and, and the good feelings that you want to experience. And what I mean by that is at times, you know, I'll turn on a positive podcast or some music and I'm like, man, God, it's just not working today. I don't know what I need to do. So this is what I'll do. And I've seen this work for several other men too. I'll walk in my door 
I'll high five all my kids. I'll throw one up over my shoulder, twist them around, I'll dip my wife down, give her a kiss. In the back of my mind, I'm like, this is kind of corny, but you know what? It works and everybody's laughing. And there's something to be said about momentum. When you start an evening like that, when you just take a few minutes to prep that, hey, I'm going to do this, it just makes the entire evening completely different. When you talk about wear and tear on your patience and your personality, something like that, you know, that can just get everybody in a different state, not just you, is so empowering and it makes the entire evening totally different. Okay, very good. All right, I like that. So more patience, take more time for self-care, listen to a positive ped podcast, be proactive in your mindset, just plan before you get home from work. Take a few minutes to get your mind right and then break the pattern of the negative thought. Okay, so what's the second pain point for men and, and the second way on how to be a better father, Larry? I mean, part of being a, a better father is having a good relationship with either your spouse or your significant other or whatever that looks like, whether you're single or married, having those positive relationships in your life. When you become a father and you're a working father, man, I mean, you are just stretched. You're, you're stretched thin on, on time, obligations, everything going on. So a lot of times what we do as men, and we don't mean to do it, um, is we kind of lose that connection. We kind of lose that intimacy you know, with our spouse. And once you've lost it, it's very, very hard to get back. And one of the things that, that I've done in the book is that I give guys just three simple strategies in the book, and they're so simple. And if we did them pretty much on a daily, monthly basis, I mean, relationships would probably be infinitely better. And the reason I say this is because, I, again, I struggled through it. There were times in my marriage, I mean, I've been married for 12 years, but I just sort of was on automatic pilot. And I wasn't feeding that relationship. And what I've really learned over the past few years is how to feed that relationship and do it very simply. And if you want, I can definitely share that with you. Yeah, go for it. Tell yeah. Us. So one of the things you want to do is take time to have a daily connection with your wife, significant other, whatever it is. Um, take time daily. And what I mean by that is don't be on your phones. Don't be sitting on the couch next to each other watching TV. That's not a connection. You're simply in the same space, but you're not connecting. Uh, one of the things that, that my wife and I do, and I've been able to interact with other dads who have implemented this and it's worked wonders, is we take 10 minutes before bed. We turn off phones, we turn off iPads, we turn off the TV, and we just have a conversation. We ask each other open-ended questions of how the day was, what we did, challenges, and we really, really connect. What I can tell you is that don't try to do something like this over dinner if you have kids. It's impossible and it'll be nothing but frustrating. So once you have that connection, you know, usually it doesn't, it's not 10 minutes. Usually it turns into 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And you know what? At times it even turns into sex. And, and why shouldn't it? Because if two people have that connection, then the intimacy is going to be there. And you'd be shocked at just, just giving each other the gift of 10 minutes undistracted works wonders for a relationship. I've got, I've got two more. Okay, go for it. Um, the other one is, believe it or not, so have what I call in the book a non-negotiable monthly date night where you literally, if you ask most married couples, this is what you'd be like, hey, you know, when was the last time you guys went on a date night? And sometimes they'll look at each other and be like, oh gosh, what, you know, what year is it? So you know, it's, it's probably been a while. So one of the things that you want to do is schedule a monthly date night, like literally three months in advance. And if you've got little kids, sit down with your calendar, with your wife, spouse, significant other, and pick out what those date nights are going to be and then book the babysitters. And what I've called those in the book is non-negotiable date nights. There's no calling in. Once it's on the calendar and the babysitters are booked, there is no negotiation. There's no backing out. It absolutely has to happen. Couple rules for the monthly date night. It has to be something interactive you know, absolutely don't go to a movie. Don't go to a movie because again, all you're doing is existing and sitting in the same space. Don't go to a concert because you can't connect. Do something where you can interact. I mean, my wife and I like to do something as simple as, as just having dinner together outside, um, outside the house, which is, it gives us an opportunity to connect without the distraction of kids, you know, and, and that just feeds the relationship unbelievably. And again, it's so simple. And um, I, I've got one more and another one. It's kind of Captain Obvious. Go for it. So the last one is when she speaks, be there. And what I mean by that is 
when she's talking to you, we as men, we like to multitask and, and try to do several things at one, you know, at once. And I'm, I'm no different than that. But when she talks part of, you know, and you know this, I, I don't have to tell you this, but the way a woman gets emotionally connected and intimate with you is by that verbal connection. So when she talks, absolutely dial in, put your phones down and just listen to her, interact with her, be very, very present, engaged with her. Nothing will turn a woman off more than if you absolutely tune out while she's talking. So those are three strategies for connection. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I went with just talking about my relationship with women. I used to want to solve a woman's problems a lot. It was like they'd come to me with a problem and I would be like, Oh, I'm the man. I'm logical. I got the solution. She yeah. Love me when I give her this solution. And I was just getting like bad attitude in return. I was like, what the hell is going on here? I've just solved her problem. Right. It took me a few years to realize that we'll actually to be told by many relationship experts and then practice it that women for the most part, uh, don't want you to solve their problems. They just want you to listen to them. They just want to listen. They want to feel like you share their pain. Like you yep. understand and, and appreciate their pain, which of course I, I, I do, but my way of appreciating it or understanding their struggle was to try and solve it. But in actual fact, you're serving a, a woman more, at least from what I found, by just shutting the hell up and just saying things like, I'm sorry, that's so bad, that must be awful. Like, but not saying it like in a trivial way, like you're not really sorry, like you're genuinely feeling her frustration and pain and sympathizing. That is 10 times more powerful than actually if you go, well, you know what, honey, this is how you should stop that. Or you know what, let's try this. That will eventually come. The solution will eventually come. But in that moment, she just wants you to, um, to feel her pain and, 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 and her struggle, if you like. So, um, so yeah, well, well said on there. Okay, so the, the second point there then, Larry, was uh, have a good relationship with your significant other. Take time to have a daily connection. Turn off the electronics. Schedule a non-negotiable date night. Make sure it's interactive. And when she speaks, just make sure that you listen. Okay, let's move along. We're on the third, the third pain point for men now and how to be uh, a better father. Yeah, so, and, and that's exactly what the third thing is all about. So again, in the book, I go over nine, but these are like the three biggest. And the third one is really a connection with your kids. And the thing is, is we as men, you know, we really sometimes aren't wired the best. It's not our fault. We aren't really wired the best to maybe communicate with like a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 16-year-old, you know, and those, those times can be very, very challenging. Sometimes we as men, we want to connect. We just don't know how. I'll, I'll share actually an interesting study with you that was done here recently that just, I mean, gives dads all kinds of props. So real quick, in 1965, there was a study done of 1965 dads and how much time they actually spent with their kids on a weekly basis. And what they found was is in the U.S., uh, for the most part in 1965, dads spent about two and a half hours with their kids per week. So, you know, nothing against that generation. They were more, more the providers. You know, they worked a lot. So there was, there was a lot of demands on their time. Now, in 2010, a very similar study was done and they looked at dads today. And what they found is, is after polling dads is they uh, actually spend 7.8 hours per week with their kids. So that time is actually tripled for what I call the modern dad. Here's the other cool part. They asked the same group of dads in 2010, do you think you spent enough time with your kids or do you want more time? And 48% of those dads said, I actually don't think I spent enough time. I want more time. So what we're really seeing is, is in the, in, for the modern dad is, not only do they spend more time with their kids, but they have a desire to spend more time with their kids, which is so cool. So it's like, you know, props to the, uh, to the modern father. So one of the ways, one of the challenges that men are faced with is like, you know, I want this connection with my kid. Like I really want a good, deep emotional, you know, connection with my kid. I just, how do you do that? Like, I don't know, you know, give me a guide and let me help me figure that out. So what you can do very similarly with your wife is have a daily connection with your kids. And what I mean by that is it's the same thing. Take 10 minutes of undistracted time with your kids. And a lot of times if you have more than one kid, which most of us do, that is extremely hard. So one of the things that, that we do, in, for example, in our house is I'll take 10 minutes with each kid as I put them down to bed. And what I'll do in that 10 minutes is, again, there's no phones, you know, there's no iPads, we're not playing video games. It's it's one-on-one -on -one time where I can actually have a good conversation. 
where guys tend to struggle a little bit too is like, well, what do I ask like a seven year old or what do I ask my teenager? Like, I don't know. Um, one of the things you can do is simply just as you prep, you know, for a phenomenal evening and, and more patient patience, you have to prep good questions for your kids. And what I mean by that is ask open ended questions, get out of the comfort zone of how was school? Did you study for that test? You know, what you, things like that ask, you know, Hey, what are three things that you're thankful for today and why, you know, what good things happened today? What you're going to find when you ask questions like that is a dialogue that you probably, you probably can't believe how great it is because that kid, no matter what age they are, they're going to open up to you. And if they're at that age where they're maybe not going to open up to you, that's a cue to ask more questions, maybe better questions. But I always try to prep at least two to three questions with my kids every night to have that interaction. So that's daily. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I, I had a bit of a strained relationship with my father when I was in my teens at school. And I always remember he would come home from work. He was a veterinarian. He'd get home around about 7 p.m. every night. And we were, me and my two younger brothers were in the TV room downstairs, invariably watching TV. And uh, he would come home and he would, stand at the top of the stairs overlooking the living room and he'd say hello and we'd all be like yeah 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 hello hello and then he'd say how was school how was school yeah 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 it was fine fine Fine. and then he would like kind of like look at us and like just sigh and then turn around and and walk back in and 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 that was the end of it so that was like that was like the correspondence or the communication that i had with my father and i it was only in later years that i realized um what a poor question he was asking, you know, um, and this is not to criticize my father, but it's just, a, you know, I was a pretty crap son to my father, to be honest. We have an amazing relationship now. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. And he spent time with me and we really connect now. It's terrific. But in later years, as I've sort of done a lot of self-development work, if you like, and I'm, I've become quite well read compared to previous years, I've learned the power of questions. And as a journalist, um, whose job it has been to ask people questions. And as a sports center anchor, and my job is to ask athletes who never want to give anything away other than, well, we just got to take each game as they come and, you know, <laughs> one game at a time. My job is to really ask a question that can extract an amazing answer. Right. When I was interviewing Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise when I was a Hollywood correspondent, uh, my job was to ask open ended questions that got amazing answers. Because with those amazing answers, you got an amazing interview. So a um, better question, like you said, here's an example that I like to use, which I actually suggested to my friend Mark Rutherford over in North Wales when I was visiting him there about three or four weeks ago because he has a few children and he asked, the, you know, he asked his, um, his son at the dinner table, you know, um, you know, how was school today? And he went, oh, yeah, fine, blah, blah, blah. And later on, I said to Mark, hey, why don't you ask him this question tomorrow night? And he said, what is it? And he said, why don't you ask him, say, what did you look, uh, what did you try and fail at school today? What did you Perfect. try and fail at school today? And he was very skeptical. So the next day, the next time at the dinner table and he goes, okay, so what did you try and fail at school today? And I was like, please let this kid answer. <laughs> please let my point be proven here. And he literally paused and thought about it. And he said, and, he, and this kid's, um, I think he's seven or eight. And he Mm -hmm. said, well, I was, we were painting and I drew a green plane uh, against the green background of the, of the, of the thing. And so you couldn't really see. the (laughs) Uh, And he he laughed and giggled. And Mark was like, oh my God, it works. Now is that, does that give tremendous insight into his day at work? Well, kind of, because now he realizes that he did painting at, at school today. Now he realized that his son actually learned you know, a, a skill, what the skill is, I don't, I don't quite know. But it, the point I'm trying to make is that, um, that if you said, how was school today? The kid would say, fine. Mm-hmm. But instead he asked a question that got him to say, what did you try and fail today? Well, I tried to draw a plane, but I drew it on the, it was in the same color as the background and blah, blah, blah. So what have you learned from that? Well, you've learned that he's done painting. You've learned that your son's trying. You learned that you, the son now can process an open-ended question and give a, de- a given answer. And so that just opens up the lines of, of communication. So I agree with you. You have to ask um, the right questions. Um, Todd Herman, who I had on the show here, he coaches uh, Olympic athletes. In, in peak, uh, he's a peak performance coach. 
he taught me a couple of years ago when I, when, I, when I did the Alpha Male Club podcast, which is what the James Swanick Show podcast used to be called. He said, if you want to achieve anything in life, become a master questioner. Ask yourself like, don't ask yourself, why is this situation happening to me? Ask yourself, how am I going to get out of this situation? Who am I going to call? What am I going to do? When am I going to do it? And when you become a master questioner, all of these amazing answers just present themselves. Asking your child, how was school today, is a recipe for very poor communication. And I don't say that like as if I know kids so well because I don't have children. But I know it from the point of view of I've interviewed celebrities, I've interviewed athletes, I've interviewed mum and dad on the street. Like I know, like it's infuriating when you ask a question which only requires a yes or no answer or a fine or okay answer. So you must ask open-ended questions all the time to really have true connection with anyone in your life, whether it's your kids, your spouse, your friends, your colleagues, your boss, whatever. I'm stealing that, by the way, if you don't mind. <laughs> Go for it. I, I love that question. I mean, I think, I think you, I mean, you just hit that point home so well. I mean, and obviously with your background, I mean, you know that probably better than anybody. And the thing is, is a lot of times the quality of our answers truly depends on the quality of our questions right. that we're asking. So if, that's what I'm saying. If you can just take a few moments to prep you know, prep for those good, good questions, you know, the good open-ended questions. That's going to allow so much more of a quality conversation and so much more of a connection. And that's what it's all about. That's what you really want is that connection. So yeah, absolutely. I love that. All right. Nice one. Well, there you go. There were three pain points for men and three ways for you to be a better father. Let's just go over them and review them, shall we, Larry? Just before we wrap this up, we're talking yeah. to Larry Hagner, who is the author of The Dad's Edge, which you can grab on, uh, on, on uh, Amazon. He's also the creator of The Good Dad Project. So the three ways were um, men obviously want more patience. So the, the first way on how to be a better father is to take more time for yourself, for self-care. Listen to something positive. Be proactive in your mindset. Plan for when you get home from work. Get your mind right. Put on powerful music, break the pattern of any negative thought, and then go in there and be positive and take action. Uh, the second uh, tip for being a great father is to have a great relationship with your significant other, whether that is uh, your wife or your girlfriend, or if you're in a gay relationship with your partner, if you're raising children together. Take time to have a daily connection with your partner. Don't be on the phone or watching TV. Take 10 minutes before bed to turn off electronics, have a conversation, ask each other open-ended questions, connect, schedule a non-negotiable date night, but make sure that that date night is something interactive. Don't go to a movie or concert. Make sure it's something like a dinner or putt putt or I don't know, going for a walk, whatever it is that you can talk and communicate. Um, and then when your partner speaks, listen, really listen, really connect. She will appreciate it. Uh, or your partner will appreciate it. And then the third tip is have a daily connection with your kids. Apparently today we're spending three times more time as we were back in the 60s. Just keep doing it. But make sure that you have undistracted time with your kids, okay? And ask yourself open-ended questions. Become a master questioner. Questions like, what did you try and fail at school today? What did you learn at school today is better than how was school today? That is what we mean by an open-ended question. Become a master questioner. And when you do, the communication just starts to open up so much more. All right. Well, Larry, thank you so much, mate. I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Um, very uh, insightful. Uh, where, can, uh, where can our viewer or listener find more about you? So yeah, number one, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I actually learned a little bit here myself. You know, maybe I need to get better at asking better questions. So maybe I should just be a father. I should really. You be should. A I'm going to be one hell of a father, Larry. I got to tell you. Is there any women out there who would like to be the mother of? My <laughs> you can send all resumes to Jill Swanick in uh, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. She takes a very keen interest in my single singlehood at the moment, Larry. <laughs> if you're a woman listening to me right now and you would like to procreate with me, 
reach out to me, send me a, send me a message on Twitter right now and tell me, yeah, James, I'm up for it. And I'll, I'll forward that on to my mother. She'll be thrilled. You can follow me on Instagram as well and check out my YouTube channel. Sorry, Larry, go ahead. No, that's okay. That's awesome. Um, so where you can find me is gooddadproject.com. Uh, that's where you'll find our podcast. Uh, my co-host is uh, Sean Stevenson from the Model Health Show. Uh, Sean and I have been friends for the past three years. Um, so you can find that podcast there as well. You also find a ton of free resources on our site on how to connect with your spouse, uh, how to connect with your kids, some of the things we just went over today, how to improve your overall health. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram, Good Dad Project, Twitter, Good Dad Project. You can also find me on Facebook. I think we have a Good Dad Project page on Facebook as well. So, and on iTunes, of course, you can find the uh, Good Dad Project uh, podcast as well as Stitcher. Very nice. Very good. Very good shout out. If you're on those social medias, just follow Larry now. Uh, follow me on Instagram, James Swanick. My YouTube channel is James Swanick. My Twitter is James Swanick. Everything is James Swanick. But send us a message now to both Larry and me and just tell us one lesson or one tip that you got out of, out of today's thing. We'd love to hear from you and we'll make sure that we retweet you. And if you comment on a photo on my Instagram or ask me a question, I'll be sure to answer your question on Instagram. Larry, this has been great. Thank you very much. You've inspired me to go out there and, you know, try and find the right, try and find, <laughs> try and find the right woman. Yeah. Taking applications. No, man, it's been a pleasure. If anything, Hey, I got some good lessons out of here too, which is I probably need to get better at my questioning. So I, I love that. <laughs> All right, Larry. Well, great talking to you. Thank you, you so too. much to you, the listener and the viewer as well. And we'll catch you on the next one. All right. Sounds good.